I didn't have any connection to economic history when I was at Princeton. They didn't really have an economic historian. In this week's podcast episode, I had the pleasure of interviewing one of my favorite economists in the profession, Dr. Leah Bustan, a prominent economic historian at Princeton University. Leah's research covers many questions in labor, migration, and urban economics, such as the great migration of African Americans from the rural South to industrial cities in the North and West, as well as the age of mass migration from Europe to the United States that happened between 1815 and 1920. She's the co-author of a new book, with Ran Abrinsky entitled Streets of Gold, America's Untold Story of Immigrant Success, which follows the fortunes of, of migrants who came to the United States. She uses with Ran multiple linked census data sets from the 1800s and 1900s to answer fundamental questions like, did immigrants in the past really pull themselves up by their bootstraps? Did their children move up the economic ladder as fast as their American counterparts or their established American counterparts, I should say. It's a fantastic book written by a fantastic economist and I had a great time interviewing her and learning more of her story uh, as she told me about moving from high school debate to becoming one of the more premier applied microeconomists working today. She's also one of the co-editors at the American Economic Review. I am the host, Scott Cunningham, and this is my podcast, The Mixtape with Scott. So it is my pleasure to uh, have on the podcast uh, one of my favorite uh, people and someone I've gotten to be friends with over the years, uh, Leah Bustan. Uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Scott. I'm so excited to be here. I didn't say it right, did I? I said Bustan, and that's that's like Mississippi way of saying it. Well, I'm not really particular. It is Bustan. Bustan. Um, but I mean... It's also the same with my first name. Like it could be Leah or it could be Leah. And yeah. I don't really care. My mom's the only one who cares. Oh, she cares. All right. Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to try to say it right then for her sake. Um, uh, so before we get, so you've got a new book out. Um, and I was wondering, you know, before we get into the book, I was wondering if you could just start off and for the sake of the listener, tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your name, your job title and uh, your employer? Well, I'm Leah Bustan. <laughs> um, that is how you say it. And um, I'm a professor of economics at Princeton. Um, and I've been at Princeton for five or six years. Before that, I was at UCLA for a long time. Yeah, great. I was, we're going to get into that. Um, so where did you, so, so before we get into uh, your book and stuff, um, I was just wondering, where, where did you grow up anyway? Where are you from? I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts, oh, okay. um, which is uh you know they say the birthplace of the american revolution mm. and now i live in princeton new jersey which i've l since learned is the location of the first battle that the americans actually like won fair and square in the revolution so mm. yeah i've come full circle mm. wow Do you like, what, so what was it like growing up in lexington I mean, to me, I felt like it was really boring in the, in the, in the moment. Uh, that's probably just because my memories of it is when I was a teenager. Yeah. And I think probably a lot of people feel that way. Like I wanted to know why my parents moved there and didn't like move to the city or closer to the city where there was more stuff happening. Mm. And now that I live in a very similar place as like an elderly person, like in my forties, <laughs> 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 I totally get like why it's a good, you know, like now I feel differently about it in retrospect. Right, right. How far away? So you're talking about Boston? You were close. Yeah. Were, what are you how far like away? Close to Boston? Boston. Um, well, the thing is, it's like around half an hour. Oh, okay. Um, but it was the one town in the area that so I heard as a kid that had like voted to reject getting commuter rail. You know, oh. like that people could take the train into the city for work. So like yeah. all of the surrounding towns had commuter rail, um, which on the weekends you could also take, like it didn't run as often, but like you could take it on a Saturday and go down and be, you know, with your friends, but Lexington decided not to have commuter rail. Right. Um, so we, I felt really isolated as a teenager. Yeah. So, cause, cause driving in the car as a teenager to Boston's like that, that, that would be like a different, that'd be kind of a bigger 
bigger ordeal than just like jumping on a train. Well, I'm a terrible driver. Uh-huh. Um, so I never felt comfortable driving like that far. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for me, maybe right. not for somebody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so if I took like a random weekend of the summer in middle school, uh, what would I have probably found you doing? Okay. Well, the summer, um, I was never in Lexington. I went to, um, sleepaway camp. Um, which I went to sleepaway camp for the whole summer, like eight weeks. Yeah. Pretty much the whole thing. Wow. Yeah. Like right when school ended, like end of June, all the way until the middle of August, which I have since learned, you know, that that's not super typical, but, um, for American Jews, it's relatively typical. I'm not saying everyone does, but um, it's a very common thing for the American Jewish community because I think the idea was, first of all, people used to live in New York City in large number and the city was like unhealthy. So they wanted to send their kids to the countryside mm. in the summertime, like there would be cholera and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and then um, as people started moving to suburbs and like assimilating, the idea was, well, we're going to really lose our culture because we used to live in neighborhoods that were very densely you know, just Jewish families. And now we're living in integrated places. Well, how are our kids going to meet other Jewish friends and whatnot? So the camps kind of stepped in and they're like, okay, we'll take your kids for the summer. um, And we'll just do like, you know, normal camp stuff, swimming and that kind of thing, but just have it be in a Jewish context and give the kids like some culture and classes and that kind of thing. So I was always gone in the summer. I have no idea what was happening in Lexington Mass in the summer. Wow. Wait, was it in Massachusetts? Um, no, my camp was in Maine. A lot of the camps were in like Maine or New Hampshire, um, oh. if you're from the Boston area. And then yeah. if you're from New York, it might be like in the Catskills or in the Poconos, like in wow. Pennsylvania. So you still keep up with any of those kids? Um, you know, I don't see my camp friends anymore, but I think of them like really fondly. And now that I moved back to New Jersey, um, actually two of my closest camp friends live in New Jersey. So as soon as I moved back, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to, you know, get back connected and, and see you guys. But then it's been COVID and it just everything's been disrupted, but I hope yeah. so. Um, now that must yeah. be like a whole, that's like a whole other life you got to live. That seems like a really big deal. It seems like everybody I would know who had like um, the summer lake house and they would like go for the whole summer and they like, it was just this whole community that they had just for that summer. And was it the same kids all the time? Yeah, it's the same kids all the time. And not only that, Scott, I feel like compared to a lake house where your parents might be there with you or yeah. one parent might be there with you, right? Um, we were like in a society of children. Mm. You know, like there was a camp director. But besides that, the counselors were like 19, 20 years old, you know, yeah. and the kids were teenagers or I guess the youngest one would be nine. Yeah. Um, and so imagine just being like in a society of kids for two, two months. Yeah. Um, that was really special. Oh, um, that sounds so wonderful. It sounds so wonderful. Uh, are you, I mean, is that the kind, is that still as common now with the Jewish community as it was when we were younger? I, I think it is. I mean, um, yeah, uh, we're definitely planning on doing the same. I think our huh. oldest kid's going to go for the first time next year. Um, oh. And so uh with the older ones they might wait till like you know he'll be almost 10 but with the little one i think she'll probably like you know by the time her older siblings are there she'll probably go when she's like eight yeah i mean i don't know for sure but you know like when you have your siblings there to kind of like protect you um so i hope so yeah i wonder if i wonder if summer camp prices have inflated since we were kids the way that college that Bommel's disease kind of could go all kinds of ways with all sorts of stuff. Is it, I wonder, I mean, it, I don't know. It's like the people That's that run those things, question. the people that run those things are probably have great outside options. You know, they're like managing a firm. No, and- but I don't know if you need that, m- that many adults. That's the thing. Like, so mm. the counselors are all like college kids Yeah, you know, right. That over the summer. True. They also, I've heard there were some issues with like J1 visas um, during COVID. So some of the counselors are coming from abroad too. Mm. Mm. Um, and so that got a little disrupted during COVID, but in ordinary times when you can have these sort of temporary work visas for the summer, oh. um, a lot of, um, of folks would come over um, to 
uh, just be a counselor for a couple of months. Yeah. So I'm not sure it's actually that expensive. That expensive? And from, I mean, it is expensive, but I don't know right. if it's increased. It, I don't like, know it's if like the, the yeah. astronomical increase like college tuition okay I don't think so because I was talking to my mom about it the other day just like how much she paid for us versus how much we're kind of looking at and it doesn't seem all that different which is interesting mm. because I think it's a lot of like cheap labor right um you know all you need to do is be able to like keep the kids occupied on the basketball court or something yeah, yeah, yeah. So. right 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 well so what were your favorite subjects in high school what do you like to do well, in high school, I cared so much more about debate than I cared about classes. Oh, yeah. Um, so I did um, high school debate team, and that actually counted as a class, which was, you know, kind of funny to us because, I mean, we would have done it anyway, no matter <laughs> what. Right. Like the few people that were on the debate team, it was like 15 of us or something in my, uh -huh. in my class, something like that. Uh -huh. um doesn't matter if it was a class or not we would have done it anyway like we were just really obsessed with it um mm. and so you know after school we would like go to the debate room and keep working on our debate stuff and then we'd have tournaments maybe like once a month or something and mm. I cared about that a lot more than my classes and in, in a way it was it was kind of an, like leading up to the kind of work that we do now as academics because it was really all about research yeah. Um, research more like lit review than independent research. It's not like we were, you know, gathering data and running analysis or anything, but we were reading about um, what other people were saying on a topic and right. finding the little nuggets um, from other people's work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It together yeah. Into, into like a logical argument. And I just like all I really cared about was that um, relative to my, my mm. classes. Hmm. Right. So, so is everybody that's really good at debate pretty similar in terms of their comparative advantage, or is it like a huge diversity of skill sets that makes people that kind of that that makes people good at debate? And where are you in that? Um, well, I have met a couple of other economists who did debate, and I have to clarify that it was policy debate, which makes a difference for those debate people who might be listening. Um, yeah, the other styles. ones like the other ones like Lincoln or Johnson or something. There's Lincoln Douglas, Lincoln and then Douglas. I think there's other ones too besides that, like parliamentary. Um, and those, as I've heard, but I don't really know, are more focused on your rhetoric and being persuasive. Um, mm. And and policy debate is not. It's just about getting as much information out there uh, and then countering the information from the other side. Mm. Um, so you have to be quick on your feet. Because right. when you hear what the what your opponent is saying, you have to respond immediately. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's something that I think is probably pretty standard across debaters. So were you reading in economists? I'm sure if you're doing policy, yeah. you're like interacting with in high school, like e economic policy. Yeah. Yeah. So one. So for the whole year, you have one policy topic to work on. Oh. So I think it was my sophomore year that we were working on healthcare reform because it was oh, during. Well, yeah, it was like during. During, during Bill Clinton. 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 Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So there was a lot of economics in that. Um, I mean, I think we were introduced to to stuff like um, you know, moral hazard and right. markets unraveling and that yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. but the thing about the debate is that if you can convince the judge that your um proposal should it not be enacted, the world might end with nuclear war or <laughs> if you can convince the judge on the other side that when you're when you're on the negative if you can convince that if the policy is enacted the world would collapse into nuclear war yeah that's the key you really have key. to get to the point where uh, you have like the worst possible harms and I then see. you can say oh well yes it's a small probability i understand that like the logical chain is very 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 te tenuous but right on the small, oh, small yeah. chance that it might lead to like the destruction of the world yeah so we ended up discussing um, budgets quite a lot because uh, the, the way to argue is like basically to switch the terrain and say, well, if we spend a lot on healthcare, that might be great, but that's going to take away from like defense spending and we need defense spending because the Russians are going to get us, you know, that sort of thing. Um, right, right, right. Well, so that's was, crazy. I mean, uh, uh, do, do you, do you graduate high school kind of like? In, interested in economics 
with that? Or were you um, thinking of like, I might become policy. a policy? Yeah. So that's why I, I went to Princeton as an undergrad because they have this policy um, major. Um, oh. And a lot of the students here at Princeton do the policy major. Oh, it's really popular. Um, it's really popular. I think mm. it's, it's like number two or three. Um, mm. I actually don't um, know of a lot of schools that have a policy major. Is that actually pretty popular? Is that a common major? Or I don't think so. I don't oh. even think it's offered at a lot of places. I don't think we have it at Baylor. I mean, um, yeah, keep going. So, so you, yeah. you, you like, so, so but Princeton's like super. So even it's like high school, you're like, I want to major in policy. What'd you want to be? Yeah. What'd you want yeah, to be? I, I to be wanted to go to, no, I wanted to go to DC and like, work for a senator or something like that you know I had no idea what the job description or title was like I didn't know I don't know I had never seen like the west wing or I don't think you know that came later um it's not that I had any clue about what really happened but I just had this sense that there was like a person in DC who set who like made the policy and then they need like an advisor who would help them do the research and I was like I want to be that advisor person Yeah. Um, yeah yeah not like a real job or anything but that's right. like what I had in mind so I I researched um which schools had policy degrees and I was like okay I want to go to Princeton because there's a policy major and then when I got to Princeton I thought that that's what I was going to do so one of the requirements is taking um you know introductory econ oh and that's how I got turned on to it who is your teacher um, do you remember so yeah um I, she actually is just retiring um this year her name is Beth Bogan um, okay. And she she taught both introductory micro and macro for a uh-huh. really long time. Yeah, uh, she's an excellent teacher, and um, you know, like real chalk and talk, like everything yeah. on the board in front of three hundred people, and like just super crystal clear. Right. Um, and I, I just you know, really connected to that way of thinking. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna just keep doing all the econ stuff too, right. like uh, on the econ track. So when I was a sophomore, I took um, uh, applied econometrics because we did. Um, Wait, are you double majoring at this point? You're no, like, no, like I was just doing the econ track too, just to kind of keep my options open. Oh, um, okay. they, don't, they don't allow double majors, um, mm-hmm. but I just liked all the econ stuff. So I was doing that. I was doing econometrics sophomore year um, mm-hmm. and then applied econometrics in the spring of my sophomore year, which is yeah. like when you really got to use data. Yeah. Um, oh. I, I think now a lot of places kind of have that where they do theory first and then they do data or they interconnect it. Right. Um, but at Princeton, it was just like an elective. Mm. You know, like if you were just going to do econometrics as the yeah. major, all you had to do was theory and that was it. Like you never had to actually t- work with the data. And then if you wanted to do applied econometrics, you could. Right. Um, so that's where I really was like, okay, this is for, you know, this is what I love. Well, um, so what happened? You're doing applied econometrics and you're working with data. What do you remember? Like, um, like the emotions of, of like, what about that? Given that you're like yeah. into policy, like, like you could imagine somebody that doesn't know what we're talking about. Can't even conceive of why that would like be this exciting thing. But so what, what happened? What, what were the feelings? What happened? Well, I'll get into that in a second, but basically like what I, what happened was I went to my, um, my teacher in that class who was, um, Hank Farber. And I told Mm. him that I loved the class, but that I wanted to go to DC. Like I had not given up on that. I said next this summer, I want to go to DC and like intern on the Hill and do data analysis for somebody there. And he said, why would you want to do that? Like I said, well, I want to, you know, affect policy and blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, you've taken one class. Like, I don't think you can really affect policy right now. Like, why don't you stay at Princeton and learn how to actually do some research? Yeah. Um, he said, why don't you come work with me? I have a project that I need help with. And uh, I said, okay, sure. And I just did you that. You just told, to- you basically just, just gave it away. You were the best student in class. <laughs> I don't know. There were some other good students too. It was also, it was only like 13 or 14 students. So I yeah. mean, I'm not sure about that. I think he was probably <laughs> just like, Oh, you know, here's someone who, um, who like, who can, who can give me a hand. Yeah. I'm not sure, but like, well, he I, could spot talent. He was right. He could, he could spot it a mile away. So he could like tell you were really good. 
That could be, but you know, I just, it was so funny because um, I now have these students coming to me yeah. uh, on the other side, right? Like I'm on the uh, other side of the desk and the way that he, um, like, I just remember that interaction really well. He, I uh, said, I want to go to DC. He said, why? Uh, said, what do you think you're going to be doing there? Um, and he was the first person who was, uh, I guess, really taking me seriously in a way. And trying to help me build toward that goal mm. um but being like but like with tough love you know kind of like if you go to dc now there's really nothing you can do like you don't right. know anything right like right. so i want to help you learn how to do something yeah. um so you better come and actually get trained mm. um so how did know. that I mean, feel how did that feel did that was that i mean you could tell you knew what he was talking about yeah i mean i almost i just immediately was like Oh yeah, that makes so much sense. Like mm. in a way by telling a person that they don't know but that they could learn. It's yeah. it's almost like the best gift. I mean, I don't really watch Star Wars. My kids watch Star Wars and I sort of see from like, you know, I'm like scrolling my phone and I kind of see from the corner of my eye, but it's sort of like Luke, right? I mean, he has to go get trained. Like he doesn't he has power but he doesn't really know what he's doing. And right. Right. Um, I don't know how much he struggles against that. I can't really remember, but I mean, I have this vague memory that he kind of actually appreciates yeah. when Yoda, when Yoda tells him, like, I see something in you and the you're thing is, ready. though, you need, you're not ready. Yeah. Not ready. That's what he was telling me. You're not ready. And I was like, okay, that actually is really helpful. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. But yeah. going back to the like emotions of being in the class, I mean, it was really wonderment because I remember um, a couple of things like, Hank brought this data set um, that has was like hot off the presses at the time. And he said, hey, you know, when you're driving down the turnpike, the New Jersey turnpike, and you get off the, the road, you feel this little like bump. Mm. Well, that bump is a strip on the road and it's keeping track of your car. It's counting how many cars are exiting the mm -hmm. highway at every given minute. So we actually have like an hourly data set at, e at every exit in every day of how many cars are leaving. So I'm just going to like pull up this data set for you. You know, it was cleaned up or something um, of how many cars are leaving the New Jersey Turnpike at every hour of the day, every day of the year. And we were just playing around with it. And I was just in shock, like to think that daily life like that could be oh, yeah. tracked, you know, I... that we could have data on we had no clue that we were part of this data set, but we were part of this data set and that yeah. you could like uncover patterns of daily life right. with data analysis. Yeah. Um, it was wonderment really. It was mm. just amazing. I was like, I really need to, to do this. I need to learn how to do this thing. Mm. Um, but I still hoped that I could go to DC and um, do something socially useful with mm. it. But all of a sudden I had this like, this real tunnel vision towards like learning how to like, sh you know, take data and, and like make it into mm. something that was interpretable. So it was like, it wasn't like you like fell in love with supply and demand or like an economic concept. It was like, it, it was, it really was something about data and what it could tell us or the stories of it or something like that is that that was really yeah. what did, did it yeah yeah that was that was definitely what, like, yeah that's right I mean I I do remember really lo liking you know basic um principles of micro and macro um and like that was what was pushing me to like take econometrics I have to say right. econometric theory was fine but it wasn't like my favorite class and so that's what was pushing me in that direction. But it's like really when I hit applied econometrics and actually using data, actually that using data. Um, that's when, yeah, that's when all the, like the bells went off. Wow. That's so, wow. That's neat. That's neat. You know, I mean, there really wasn't a counterpart for that like a hundred years ago or was there, was there, you would know. I mean, was there like, I mean, you, I guess I'm thinking were... like W.E.B. Du Bois. Like if you guys have seen that amazing uh, book that came out with the colorized oh, yeah. uh, graphs. I have it downstairs. Made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think people, there were people who were able to see the patterns, right? right? right and right, visualize right. the patterns in amazing ways, yeah. but it, it was maybe hard to bring to the masses without yeah. mass computerization. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. That That's going to, I have a thing about that in a minute. So, okay. So, so then you're like, all right, that's it. I got to be, I got to be an economist. 
Yeah. And then I stayed at Princeton um, for um, two summers, like sophomore summer going into junior year and then junior summer going into senior year. And uh -huh. I got to sit with all the grad students because I was the uh -huh. only undergrad that was there. Now I think it's more like formalized where undergrads can do like research opportunities in the summer. They can go work at a lab, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really just more individualized where Hank's like, oh, hey, come work with me. Um, and at least in the econ department, I didn't see any other undergrads there. Now, I hope none of my fellow class of 2000 or 2001 economists, of which there are many, um, they hope they don't come and tell me, oh, I was there too and you just didn't know. Um, like Emmy Nakamura and John Steinson and Moto Yogo were all um, at Princeton around the same time I was. Mm. So I might stand corrected, but I didn't see anybody else. I was down with the, um, the labor grad students and it was just me and them. And they were so welcoming, so nice. They taught me how to, you know, I would overwrite my do files on Stata like regularly, um, you know, uh, just make all kinds of terrible <laughs> mistakes. And <laughs> they would, they would like help save me and teach me commands and yeah, um, really very like person to person um, learning. And I was able to kind of just look over their shoulder and they were yeah. so nice to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then you go to Harvard. So that must have been really exciting. I mean, it's funny. You've not said history one time. Yeah. Policy... Well, I didn't have any. I didn't have any connection to economic history when I was at Princeton. They didn't really have an economic historian. Uh huh. But I, um, uh, I knew I wanted to, to like learn more about cities. And mm -hmm. I was interested in like great society programs um, and President Johnson and like what went right and what went wrong in the 60s. And so I was taking all of the other urban classes that I could take. Like there, there, um, there wasn't really urban economics. So I took urban sociology and politics and um, even at Harvard, Glazer, Glazer. No, no, I'm talking about when at I was Princeton. At Princeton. Got it. Yeah, so yeah, when right. I was an undergrad, like I had no connection to ah. um, to economic history here at Princeton. Yeah. So we haven't talked about history yet because it like really hadn't happened in my life right, right. yet. Um, right. And um, so you were like, it was the city stuff. You were like, you were kind of, you were, you were taking cities and then you were like, you were really interested in econometrics and, and that and data and, and, right. you, and data and you had not had any uh, yet and had the, the, had, hadn't been bit by this history bug. No. Um, okay. But I knew that like, I was interested in, 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 whatever issues were urban issues of the nineties, I was like, well, they didn't just start then, you right. know, um, like I wanted to kind of go back in time, but not, not back to like, you know, the American revolution or anything, but I wanted to go back 30, 40, 50 years and understand um, the new deal and understand great society and that kind of thing. Um, right. so 20th century. Yeah. Um, and then when I graduated from Princeton, I didn't go straight to Harvard. I did um, write, for a year at the American Prospect magazine. Yeah, um, I read this. Isn't that where you did that uh, that 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 article that was like, I believe it had something to do with with maybe sex trafficking or yeah, yeah. It was like yeah, I was I was so surprised one day when I found it. Well, you were so you were like yeah. early twenties. Yeah, they had a writing fellowship where you could go for a year um, and um, just like write for the magazine. It was probably just like a way for them to. Um, you know, get a lot of copy relatively cheaply because we were all like excited to be there and the pay was definitely not very high. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, when I was at Princeton, in addition to being uh, really into data and, 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 and econ research, I also was um, uh, writing for the alternative newspaper mm. um, and eventually became editor in chief. And so- oh. Just like when I was in high school, I was just really into debate. Like at Princeton, yeah. I was really into the newspaper. So I wasn't sure, like, did I want to maybe go into journalism or did I want to um, uh, do a PhD? So yeah. I did that year um, in journalism. And I don't know wh whether I might have continued, but I ended up getting an NSF, like a grad research NSF. And so I only had one year to defer. Oh. So I de so I deferred and then I applied to grad school while I was on that one year writing fellowship and that was it like that was my one year of journalism. Right, right. Yeah. You're a great writer. You're phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah, I mean you 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 are such a you have such a wonderful voice. Um uh 
so so then I I I could uh, spend so much time. I do want to talk about your book, but I just want to real quickly talk about Harvard. So that must be where something <clears throat> something happens at Harvard where you move away from cities a little bit, maybe maybe not, but like you're at least moving into history, I guess, right? At Harvard. Yeah. Yeah. Um so I didn't even really know there was such a thing as economic history, but when I was at the American Prospect um and doing the writing fellowship, one of my other fellow writing fellows um was hearing like you know hearing me talk about my interest and he said that sounds like economic history and I said what's economic history and he told me about it he had taken an economic history class in college he's like that just really sounds like what you're into like you're interested in contemporary problems and stuff but you want to understand like the backstory like why did things evolve this way and he's like that seems to be like what economic historians are doing I said oh okay cool and then I looked up you know Claudia Golden Mm. and that's how I ended up deciding to go to Harvard. Um, yeah. So, so, so you, you knew about her before you got there. Yeah. Like I contacted her when I was applying or when I got in or something like that. Uh-huh. Um, and, and I got into a couple of other schools and I um, talked to a couple of other folks from other schools and I was like, Oh, do you guys have economic history here? And they're like, well, I wrote a paper with some old data. Um, and so and that's so, economic history. like, you could, <laughs> You know, and I was like, okay, well, you know, Claudia was a real deal. So I was excited to go work with her. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, so what's she like? A lot of people don't know her. So it, what, they just know of her. What is she like? What was she like for you? I mean, what, it, what, what, what did, what was, what about that relationship is worth mentioning? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think that. Claudia when she looks at you she like looks into your soul you know she she really like takes you in as a whole person and takes Mm -hmm. you incredibly seriously and like thinks about what what what's going to make you happy what your interests are and how to help like set you on that path to um uh to accomplish that so I mean she's an incredibly special person in that way she does not see people as some sort of like you're a graduate student. You're a cookie cutter graduate student to me. Like, oh, you're the new student interested in labor. She really just wants to get to know you and help people um, accomplish um, what they set out to accomplish. And I think that's the way she sees the world. Like, mm. she's incredibly curious and she Im- imagines that other people probably are too, like that they have the level of intensity. Right. Um, that she has, right, and right, so right. She, um, like elevates people around her yeah. to that level. Yeah. So she, so, so, what did you, what do you feel like was was different about you as a result of just having that kind of mentorship from her? If you had to guess, what do you think it passed on to you? Well, you know, the, the most amazing thing about um, my relationship with Claudia when I was a grad student is I didn't actually stay at Harvard for very long. I was there for two years and then my husband got a job and we, and we moved away. Um, wow. uh, we moved um, first to, um, to Philly for his postdoc for a year and then for two years to Minnesota, which was his first job was at the university of Minnesota. Wow. And Claudia was always like, so supportive of that. Um, Uh. so like I would come back to, I I sort of committed that I was going to come back to Harvard every two months for two weeks. Um, so I'd be gone for six weeks and I would be there for two weeks. Um, so I missed out on a lot of the kind of like training, like by osmosis, you know, going to seminars and all those kinds of things. But whenever I came back, Claudia would always say like, oh, you know, here's Leah, like her husband's such a superstar. He's such an amazing academic. He's working on this or that. Like she, you know, kind of was keeping up on what he was doing. Um, And she's like, you know, he's in the humanities, but he found a, he found a job right away, which is such a huge accomplishment. Um, She was always pumping him up and us up as a couple and our decision to move together and follow and like get his career started and like she was always talking about that to other people and, and how supportive she was. And then when I was done and I finished and I graduated and I got a job at UCLA and we both got jobs at UCLA, she said to me, you know what, to be honest, I was really worried about you. I was worried that you were going to like float off and that, you know, like you wouldn't come back as often as you said, you wouldn't stay focused on your dissertation. 
Um, not because there was anything about you that led me to have that concern, but just like it happens, like people, yeah. if they're separated uh, from their academic institution, if they're, they're off somewhere, like they can, other things come up in life and, you know, they can drift away. But I didn't want to ever say that to you because I didn't want you to think and put that thought in your head and think I was worried or that I was spending less concern on you relative to my other students. Wow. Wow. I mean, so that's really amazing mm -hmm. that, um, that she was just like, it was like, kind of she had this bird's eye view of how everything was going to work out and she was like this sort of protector yeah. figure over the whole thing like right. it was it was really amazing um yeah. so I don't think that I could have even gotten started on my path to my career mm. like in any way without someone who had that that point of view mm. um wow. it's tough when your students go off um yeah. and that's definitely happened to me as well it's really tough to yeah. to not like, I don't mean write them off, but just kind of like you put a probability on the yeah. the different outcomes and then you live with that expected, you know, expected value of the outcome. And, right. and Claudia just, she put the probabilities, but then she put it aside and she just went all in on like the commit, the committed outcome. Right. And, and then she sort of almost like willed it into existence. That's beautiful. That is such a beautiful story. Um, thank you for sharing that. That's that's. She sounds wonderful. I I don't really know her, but she just sounds like a, I, I just a great. Everything I know is that she's wonderful. But that's a great story. Well, I want to talk about your book. I want to say uh, the the name of your the name of your book, Streets of Gold: America's Untold Story of Immigration Immigrant Success, with Ron. Well, can you tell me how to pronounce pronounce Ron Abramsky's full name? I don't think I said it right. Ron Abramitsky. Abramitsky. So, um, so this book uh, just came out, and I just want to say uh, it has a mesmerizing cover. The, the cover's you know, the that, best part about it. You it have to so see this cover. It's so beautiful. I can't even take my eyes off of it every time I see it. I don't know what it is. The, the, uh, I bet you must have been so. Did you? Were you ha happy when you saw it? Oh my god! They said just sent the cover as an attachment to email, and they're oh like, hey, you, "Like, what do you guys think?" And I was like, 10 of ten, no notes." <laughs> like, seriously, I have nothing to say. Um, yeah. It really captures the uh, spirit of the book yeah. um, so perfectly. Um, uh -huh. For those of you who haven't seen the cover, it's like words don't really do it justice, but. Um, in the foreground is like a black and white image mm. of an immigrant family, like a historic immigrant family, say like maybe arriving at Ellis Island. And right. they're looking out at a city. It's probably New York yeah. like, uh, ahead of them. And as they're looking out ahead of them, they're seeing New York like in technicolor, like a rainbow up oh. over the city. And it really highlights the optimism mm -hmm. um, of, of the book. And it's like, really? okay, it's all in the cover. Yeah. Pictures worth a thousand words. Yeah. Like, yeah. All right, we're done. <laughs> wow. But what it was, it, it really, it wasn't just that it was a beautiful image, but it made, that was the one moment when I realized that the book worked because we didn't speak to the artist at all. Mm. We never even got a chance to speak to the artist. I've never even been able to thank the artist. Um, but the artist read the book and got the message and it almost just like, the message of the book just drew into his mind and he was able to output it as an image. And then I thought, well, geez, it must work because this is exactly what I had in mind Wow! when I was writing and look, wow. it's been reproduced. It's just absolutely probably one of the best covers. I mean, you know, I just can't even, I couldn't even figure out that I liked it. It was just like, I just could just every time I saw it, I just would, just stare at it. Um, so, so how did you guys, well, first of all, uh, let's see, what do I ask first? Well, first, let me ask you this. How did you get interested in this topic of immigration? Was this part of the dissertation? No. Um, okay. my dissertation was about, um, black migration from the rural South, right. Um, right. up to industrial cities. Mm. So it was like, um, it was a migration story, migration and mobility yeah. dissertation. And, and, and from that, I learned all of the economics of immigration literature. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, I, for that, for my dissertation and for the, for the first book, I basically thought to myself, like, what if we retell African-American history 
um, but using all of the lessons from the economics of immigration. Mm. Um, you oh. know, if we really take Nobody seriously. Done that? No, I mean, the people were sort of just taking as given, okay, well, here's what the black population is. Like they live in Detroit, they live in Chicago, jobs mm -hmm. are disappearing, uh, deindustrialization, um, crack epidemic, um, mass incarceration, whatever the story of the moment, right. but not like, oh, how do people get here and where did they come from? And what was the experience of going from an agricultural place to an industrial place and how much assimilation was there once people yeah. arrived and that kind of thing. Yeah. So that was the first, my first project. And so I did learn all the economics of immigration stuff pretty well from that. Are you working um, with the census data on that project? A little bit. Like I was, hadn't really done much with the linked census data um, by, by then. And then like at the very, very tail end, as I was finishing up that book, yeah. the first book, I sort of did like a quick census linking exercise to put in there. Mm. Um, it, that was like where I overlapped between the two projects. Mm. Um, but then my second project was with Ron and with Catherine Erickson and um, other co-authors that we've had uh, over the years. Now like Santi Perez and um, just a whole set of people. I can't even give. So this is at people. UCLA. This, 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 this is at UCLA. UCLA. Yeah. And Catherine was one of my first grad students, not my first, but uh, one of my first grad students at UCLA. And so she was in for, on the project from the very beginning there. Um, and this all was a California project um, because I met Ron out there too. He's at Stanford. Because he's at Stanford. So you're yeah. at UCLA, he's at Stanford. He's an economic historian, but had he been working yeah. on immigration? No, he was work. His first book was on the Israeli kibbutz. Mm. Um, and the kibbutz is like, actually his family had originally been living on a kibbutz. Yeah. Um, in the previous generation. So it's like a totally equal sharing society where you just like pool all of your income. You can also work in the city and you can go work as a lawyer if you, you know, if you want to, but then as soon yeah, as you come back. home, you just have to bring the money back. Yeah. Give it back. Yeah. Um, and you have to give all the money back and share. He it grew up in one. He grew up he, in No, that? he did. His, his mom did. Oh, um, okay. And so he would always go back um, to the kibbutz in the summer. And I think that maybe some of his siblings might still, like might have gone back. I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble for that. Um, but there's definitely still some family connection. Um, but I he himself. That. I, I bet uh, it's like so in my DNA to go live in a kibbutz. I mean, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not Jewish, but so I guess it's like not completely my DNA, but like just the just the idea of the the, the community. Just all of us. All I know. Of us together. I mean, he said that his for his child, it's ideal for, for kids. He said, yeah. I mean, he said, like, it's just like heaven on earth as a kid um, mm. to, uh, to just be there in the summer. Um, and yeah, so I think we're all, I mean, OK, I can't speak for all, but many of us are yearning for the idea that we might have a community that's tight knit and where people really do help each other and care about each other. And so um, here we have this situation in Israel where there were these equal sharing communities right next to the market economy. Like there were no walls and barriers, oh, right? Wow, so people yeah. can move back and forth, but the kibbutz also had some control. They didn't want to just accept anyone who comes in. So there's a sure. lot of, of kind of internal barriers of like a uh, vetting process and that kind mm, of thing. Mm. Um, so all kinds of interesting economics there, totally, but also some migration issues too of like who moves in, who moves out. Yep. So that's what we were talking about originally was this sort of, what y'all knew each other and you guys were just like talking. We were talking shop, at a like conference, at the ASSA or something. Well, it's a very special conference that we, if it hadn't been for this conference, maybe the whole project wouldn't have happened. But um, we went to this, you know. So in California, we're pretty isolated from the rest of the academic community. So we built up all of these California-specific small conferences so that yeah. you don't have to. Every time you go back, believe me, I just got back from the West Coast um, with my kids two days ago, and it's like, it's a whole day ordeal to just come back from the West Coast, right? Yeah. So you want to have some intellectual community and not have right. to go far. So they have all these like UC specific things. And then, you know, we would deign to allow Stanford to come to the UC things, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> even though they're not in the UC. Um, so we had a conference where it was designed um, to have two hours off in the middle of the day just for people to walk around in these beautiful gardens. Um, and that's where Ron and I were chatting. And we were talking about the overlap between our work. You know, you wouldn't think the kibbutz and Black migration would have anything in common, but they did have this overlap 
with thinking about migration and that's mm. how we got started talking about this project what was the so what so when you say the project like what what the, you guys have this vision out of that conversation y'all can sort of cease this or was it one paper um it was maybe a little more like a vision um mm -hmm. but i don't know if i'm reading too much back into it but um it was uh this idea of really trying to um retell the story of migrants from migration from Europe to the United States, but with microdata. With um, microdata. So that was yeah. the, that was the hook. You guys were like, so so it is this like a pivotal moment or something, like something I don't really understand where census records historically could not be linked and now they are linked. And also could you just say for the listener's sake, when you say, you know, when, when the words linked census records come together, like could you just tell a little bit of the story of that? Like, cause that's, that's a big part of this. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So, uh, Ron's advisor at Northwestern was Joe Ferry and Joe Ferry was one of the first people to do census linking. His, um, process was much more by hand mm. uh, than people uh, do now. Wow. That would have been a pain. Um, there was like census indexes that he was using and he had um, some kind of algorithm in his mind of like, okay, then this will count as a link and this won't. Oh, and wow. essentially what we were doing was we were taking Joe's ideas and we were creating a computer algorithm out of what was in Joe's head. Mm. Um, and uh, I think at the time there was one complete digitized U.S. census, which was 1880. 1880 was done first, um, and it was um, it was already posted um, up at the IPM's website. But all of the other censuses that were being um, digitized that we have available to us now, I don't think were available yet. Mm. I think we just had one, and then you could try to link um, a sample to that one complete census. Um, and you're linking a person, really right? You're linking yeah. a person. That's what you're doing. You're like Scott Cunningham, 1880. Oh, look, another guy named Scott Cunningham, 1900. I know about the 1890 yeah. fire. Yes, yes. I learned about that the other day. So, uh, so then you link. So, so th this is like, I guess, like it's it's particular kinds of questions that make this. You would even want to do this, right? Like, you don't have to be an economic historian and link. I mean, so so this is the so this is kind of like moves into your title, which is like this is about upward mobility or changes over time or success, right? Is that what you're kind of thinking? I mean, I exactly. I mean, exactly. So it's really um, useful for uh, anything that's intergenerational so that you right. find someone as a child in their childhood household. Mm -hmm. um, you see what their parents are doing, um, their parents' occupation, um, the county that they're living in. So maybe the county they're living in has been exposed to something like yeah. environmental pollution or de desegregation of the schools or whatever it is. And then the idea is you can follow that person until they're in the labor market and look at the long run effects. So anything that's intergenerational, you can now do. And then anything that's also like over a lifetime. So you want to look at someone's career trajectory. And as a labor economist, when you're thinking like yeah. age earnings profile, right? Mm -hmm. And so basically a lot of the immigration stuff is age earnings profiles. And the mm -hmm. idea that immigrants are going to maybe have a steeper age earnings profile, they're going to learn more on the job with every year that they work and get more return to experience because they start out like not knowing English and, you know, then they're also learning English on the job. Yeah. Um, so it's really that sort of like career trajectory stuff that the linking can be good for as well. Right, right, right. right. Um, but initially we were like, maybe we were just crazy jumping in and didn't know all the challenges we would face, but we thought, let's not just link people, let's link transatlantically. Like let's get a census from, Europe, childhood, and then try to link people to the United you States. You guys and, are crazy. That's amazing. Yeah. So that was really wild. But that came from, see, here's where life can be really serendipitous. Um, You know how I said my husband's first job was at the University of Minnesota? Yeah. So we had moved there and we bought a house in Minneapolis and I went every day to the university and just like hung out. So who was I hanging out with? I was hanging out with the Minnesota Population Center people who put uh -huh. all the census data together. Yeah. And one day there was this like guy there from Norway um, who's 
what's he doing? Oh, we're actually coordinating all the census data from Norway, Sweden, and the UK and Canada with the United States. And so we're gonna put together this project and we're all gonna post our 1880 or 1881 or whatever um, census data up on a common website and harmonize it. So in the back of my mind, I knew that there was this transatlantic data. Yeah. It, was, it wasn't linked, but it was oh, available. It was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew it was there. I knew they yeah. had complete sense. And so just because of like hanging out somewhere as a grad student and just paying attention to what was happening. Yeah. Yeah. So the, that's amazing. That's just, yeah, there's so many parts here. I wrote too many questions. So, um, so the, 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 the title is interesting. America's untold story, immigrant success. So before I, you tell me what the untold story is, I was wondering what are the told stories about immigrants uh, that have, that, that are like that, that, that are out there. Well, the told story about immigrants, I think is this idea of rags to riches. Um, from the Ellis Island generation. So the, there's this, you know, if you, you have to go back four generations or so to get to the immigrants that are coming from Europe. That's my family. My family's been in the US four or five generations. Mm. Um, and so then it's, it's a bit lost to the sands of time, right? So we end up with these very rosy and nostalgic stories of, um, first of all, that the idea that people were arrived in poverty and then secondly, that they moved up from poverty very quickly. Mm. And it turns out that neither of those things are true when you look in the data. But th hey. that's the told story. The told story is immigrants from Europe 100 years ago were um, poor, but they very quickly were able to make it in the United States. And what's left sort of maybe unsaid sometimes is this implicit contrast to immigrants today, that immigrants today aren't moving up very quickly and that they aren't doing as well. Now, you can see that both on the right and on the left, right? On the left, you'd say, well, they're not doing well because they're face they face racism. Immigrants today are more likely to be coming from you know, Latin America. They're brown um, and they are facing barriers. On the right, you're going to hear a different story like, oh, these people are just sort of, you know, uh, not as, not as good. Like they're not European, um, and they're who never going to be. Who, as gain, who gains from that story? You know, people tell stories presumably, maybe because they're true, and then if it's not true, it would be because they're either confused or they gain from it. So, 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 who gains from that story, and who loses from it? Hmm. Wow, that's a that's a fascinating question. Um, I. You know, I, one thing to keep in mind is I think that this is a story that keeps getting retold. Yeah. Like, basically, like, when Germans first started arriving, um, then the English were saying, oh, they're never going to make it. And mm -hmm. then the Germans seemed to do okay, and then they would tell the same stories about the Italians. And mm -hmm. now the Italians would tell the same stories about the Mexicans. And what people are surprised about is that now the Mexicans are telling these stories about the Central Americans, you know, about, like, the Nicaraguans or the Guatemalans. So I think that it is um, something that comforts people, I guess, uh, to differentiate themselves right. from, from really newcomers. Right. And even within, like, I was talking about sort of across ethnic lines, but even yeah. within an ethnic community, you'll often hear someone who's been in the U.S. 30 or 40 years complaining about the person who just arrived. And I think it really comes from this, confusion between um uh levels and growth yeah like when you first arrive and you come from a country that like where very few people even get a chance to go to high school like of course you're not going to look like you're earning very much and of course right. you're you know your house might not look very kempt because you don't have a lot of money to to rent a nice place or whatever yeah the question is is that where you're staying like is that your is that your destiny and you're going yeah. to stay in that spot right. um, over the course of your life or over, in, you know, then into your kids' lives too. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I was just kind of thinking, it, does that story, do you, do you think that story of rags to riches invites any kind of negative judgment towards immigrants now? Like if they don't fit that story at all, then there's something wrong with them maybe. Oh yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the, on who it's who who you ask but yeah absolutely i mean uh we've heard 
we went back and listened to like old Rush Limbaugh shows where yeah. he was saying really positive things about Italian Americans and then immediately turning around and saying, oh, but the Mexicans don't do this. Um, and so, yeah, he was definitely saying, well, this is because of something faulty in Mexican culture. Yeah. Uh, but you also can hear people saying, oh, it's it, it's it's not it's not the fault of the individual or the person. It's like our society is, um, is sort of rigged against against upward mobility or that kind yeah. of thing. Um, so you could blame the person or you could blame the structure. But actually what we're saying in the data is that's not even true. Like immigrants today are actually doing just as well as immigrants a hundred years ago. So, so, so what is the untold story that y'all are telling if it's not rags to riches? Yeah, I mean, so the story, the true story um, which you need the full data to see, you need like the millions of observations in the past and you need the modern data too. Uh, the true story is that the immigrant generation, like the people who actually move here, never do that well. Like it's always an impediment to come to the U.S. and not know English and have to kind mm. of build up a new network and start fresh. Oh, yeah. So it, it always takes that generation doesn't move up very much relative to where they started. But mm. the kids do remarkably well. And that's true now. And it's true in the past. Mm. And so the kids, uh, even of certain countries that you would point to today, you hear them in the press all the time of, you know, they're contributing to crisis at the southern border or that sort of thing, like talking about Central Americans or Mexicans. Those kids are doing remarkably well now and mm. just at the same level as um, or to the same degree as Italians or Irish or Portuguese the Portuguese mm. um, or the Scandinavians in the past. Mm. So, so if you had to like, I, I can't put this into words very well, but it's like, you know, you think about the concept of matching, right? So it's like, if you could say, uh, if you were to match an, an immigrant's child with a, with a native uh, child, you know, like in the distribute, like who, when you say they're doing well, could you sort of say like, they're just like blah, blah, blah. Like who are, who are they like? Well, there's two ways of thinking about it. One way is like totally uncontrolled or unconstrained, not matched to anyone, right? Mm -hmm. In that case, immigrant kids are being raised in poorer households. Yeah. So if they're reaching like just the median, just the average, then you say, wow, they've really moved up a lot yeah because, the because like well, so, so so i didn't mean to interrupt you but like if you, yeah, when you say when you that that's a great point so like if i was to take uh an immigrant uh who's grown up in this poor household of like some income level of the household and then i was to say well, all right here's a uh non-immigrant uh of that same household income level and i was to just sort of like watch a cohort they're going to overtake them are they yes. going to do the same yes like, what, what's exactly. it going to look right. like Exactly, exactly. So that's the implication. That's exactly where I was going. So if you can see in the uncontrolled comparison that the children of immigrants are being raised in poorer households, but yet they're um, reaching the median, mm. then you know that if you find a, a child of U.S. born who had the same low income level, right, yeah. and you're actually matching on initial household income level, then the children of immigrants are going to be doing a lot better. Mm. And by doing a lot better... Um, what I mean is, you know, you can put this in terms of like your rank and the income distribution. Um, and I'll just throw out a couple numbers for you. Um, just to, just so we have some numbers to, to think about, think about kids who are being raised at the 25th percentile mm -hmm. of the income distribution. Some of those kids are children of immigrants. Some are children of us born. And actually we look at white us born because we don't want it all to be sort of a race story. Um, and then where do they end up in adulthood? Children of U.S. born end up at the 46th percentile. So there's some regression to the mean. There's improvement. Children of immigrants end up at the 51st percentile. And then if we break it down into these different countries of origin, some children of immigrants who are being raised at the 25th percentile get all the way up to the 65th. Okay, so like if you're talking about a child from whose parents were born in Asia, they're getting up to the 65th percentile. Yeah. If you're talking about a child whose parents um, were born in South America, they're yeah. getting up to like the 56th, 57th, you know, so it depends on the country, but they're, I mean, that's just a staggering difference. Yeah. 
So, so it, could some of it be that the, some of these immigrants are moving into areas and the, when you compare them to that, you know, 25th percentile that those people are in the South and, or so, like, is, is it, is it some kind of weird geographic confounder uh, that like, if you were to compare them to 25th percentile, like, like how close, how, how weird is this exactly? Is it like, yeah, is it, is it really, I mean, it's that's like exactly right. Puzzle? I mean, that's exactly right. It, it, it turns out not to be too much of a puzzle because of the um, geography of, mm. of where immigrants settle. Um, so if we were going to compare to the kid down the street, yeah, then the children of immigrants actually don't do any better than the oh. children of the U.S. born. So we did that comparison and we're like, wait a second, what's going on? So what we learned from that is that a lot of this immigrant advantage, the for that uh, cruise to the children of immigrants is coming from the locations where immigrants settle. Oh, They're wow. not spread uniformly across the U.S. And at least historically, if we're talking about Ellis Island period, it's really, really staggering that um, 15 percent of the U.S. population was foreign born and only 2 percent of the southern population was foreign born. Yeah. So basically, immigrants avoided the South. I mean, there was one one ex uh, exception, which is um, Ben Bernanke's family. Ben Bernanke's family is from South Carolina mm. um, and they, you know, originally were immigrants from Europe and moved down there. Um, I'm not trying to say he's the only one, but like right. It, right. you find a couple of examples where people were moving south, but that yeah. is just absolutely the exception. and It's not the rule. And, um, you know, if you're talking about 1910, 20, living in the South was a low mobility place for everyone. Yeah. Not just Black, but also white Americans, too. Right, right. Is that a big part of what you found? This is like, there's a big part of this is, is like cities almost or yeah. geography. Yeah. Yeah, a big part of it is um, it's region first, and mm. then beyond region, it's also cities. Mm. Yeah, immigrants got to the right place at the right time, and they're still doing that today. Um, the facts for the past are just staggering. The facts mm. for today um, are not as strong, but they are. The, the patterns are there too. Wow, it must have been just such a intellect. I just would be curious, you know. There's a there's a little kid listening to this like I in my dream there's a little <laughs> Leo Bustan listening to the the mixtape podcast and uh and and it's like I would be just curious how would you articulate to that to her out there you know what it has felt like for you to go on this journey and make and, and learn something that nobody knew and and doing it in the way that you did it what is that felt how would you explain that to somebody who's never felt that. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, I think that maybe I'll try to ex explain it a little bit from the, from the perspective of like an undergrad or a grad student. I don't know about like a 12 year old, but, um, when, if you're just getting started with research, um, they often tell you like, okay, let's see if you can figure out whether A causes B, you yeah. know, just, just keep it really simple. Does A lead to B? And I feel like with that kind of analysis, you never really know for sure if there might be, you might be missing something. There's a confounding factor, like, um, and you're, I, I've done a lot of papers like that, uh, but I always feel like, well, I think A is related to B. I mean, I've done my best. I've checked everything, but I, I think, and here I actually feel like I know yeah. because I'm doing descriptive work um, yeah. uh, much more so. Uh, you know, now than I used to, um, and just trying to like lay down new patterns, collect new data. Um, in the case of the census data, it's data that's out there, but has never been used in this way. Yeah. So I don't mean to say that I'm like literally like recovering it from an archive or anything, but like it's, it's just never been looked at in this way. So every new fact is like, is, does have a feeling of discovery and also yeah. a feeling of like a feeling of truth to mm. some extent. I mean, there's certainly like layers of interpretation that you put on things. And when yeah. you try to like wrap it up into 
uh, a final paper or a final story, you're layering on some interpretation there. But I do think that the underlying facts are what they are and they were yeah. not known before. And that feels right. really good. There's like a feeling of I, the, but the closest thing I can think of is when you're trying to work on a piece of music and you're just not getting it, not getting it. And then you get it and you're like, you can't take that away from me. Yeah. I, it is what it is. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, I have one last question and then uh, I, I've got to let you go. Um, it's been so nice to have you uh, on here. Um, what is your not okay. So I asked Susan Athey something and I said, what is your favorite? And she said, you're not supposed to say, what is your favorite? You're supposed to say stuff you like, because it's too mm -hmm. hard to talk with whatever your favorite is. So I'm not going to ask you what your favorite paper in economics is. I'm going to say, tell me a paper that you, that you find that you've thought about that, that kind of comes to your head that, that you think about it every now and then, or that you, that you do like. Who's mm -hmm. the author? Oh my gosh. I agree with Susan. You can't say favorite because, um, you know, it, it can change and it can wax and wane. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the paper that I really just can't get out of my mind, um, uh, probably since grad school is the original, um, uh, power to the pill paper by, uh, Claudia Golden and Larry Katz. Yeah. Um, it has a really simple model. Like I don't necessarily remember all the empirics in it, um, but it has a really simple model of a marriage market um, yeah. that um, describes how um, there's a world before contraceptive technology and there's certain matching that happens and certain marriages that occur. And then there's a world after and different yeah. marriages occur after right. the contraceptive technology. And they point out that there are winners and there are losers <laughs> among the women. There are some women who are like, oh, score, because of this new technology, I can really like fully more fully be who I be who I am, be myself and bring more into this partnership. And then there's yeah. other women who are like, oh, I was on top of the world before and now I'm not. And I've been thinking about that just for 20 years. Like I haven't yeah. done anything about it, but I just keep thinking about the idea of winners and losers and um, some, you know, this really sunny vision of like technological progress because contraceptive yeah. technology is a technology and um, this really, really nice um framework for thinking about um who benefits and who might lose out um and just i would love to be able to do something like that one day you yeah. know i feel like that's really one of the um strengths and powers of economics is to like have a couple pages in which like, like a framework where you really um put everything together and come out yeah. with a new insight like that i just feel like yeah i've been all about data for sure like since since i was in college and i love i love um, patterns and data, but, um, I would love one day as like maybe a, a new challenge, um, to, you know, ever have something as insightful as I remember that paper being. Yeah. I love that paper too. It, I, I am, you know, uh, not just saying this, but, uh, I, I'm so, I feel that you're just, that we're all so fortunate to have you in the job with us. It's so, you're just always so happy. And, uh, I mean, it's, I, I know that everybody, you're not just always so happy, whatever, but I, I, you're very, you're a very pleasant and kind and intelligent and funny person. And I appreciate, uh, everything you are, uh, kind of as a, another uh, economist out there, uh, just interpersonally. And I learned so much from you, uh, in so many ways, uh, from your, from your work and just from your, your take on things. And so I just wanted to say, it's really, really great that you, decided i'm glad that that uh faber uh uh had that conversation with you glad you took thank that applied econometrics class thank you thank you scott <laughs> i really appreciate it i mean i could just talk with you all day and uh i'm i'm so glad we had a chance to to chat um at such length um i loved it so thanks for asking me to do this and yeah. um i'm excited to continue to see all the work that you do um here on the mixtape Cool. All right. Bye. Bye, Scott.